Hey family, welcome to the official YouTube page of One. I'm excited that you're here. This message is getting ready to bless your life. I want you to stay connected to the incredible things that are happening in this movement. So don't forget to subscribe and turn on your notifications. And if you want to partner with us in some of the great things that we're doing all over the world, you can give as well. Now it's time to get into this word. I love you. God bless you. Let's stay connected. You know, one of the things that I am beginning to really have to reconcile is that One House does not want me to be a part of the worship team. I, every time they start singing, I start opening up my mouth because I feel like I can sing the way that they do, but they just make it increasingly clear that there is no room for beginners at One House. Don't you love just having an opportunity to be in the presence of God, to be reminded by the words of our worship songs, just how faithful God is and how He shows up for us in every season. There's nothing like worship for me. It invites me into the presence of God and instantly those things that were worrying me, that were bothering me, immediately begin to vanish, even if they don't let me join the worship team. They tell me, my mother says I'm in the joyful noise choir. I have joy, but it is a noise. Is that anyone else's testimony? If that's your testimony, say, that's me, that's me, that's me. I am gonna ask them though, if we can start singing Holy Spirit Activate on Activate Nights, you know? And I don't know if they're gonna say yes or no because they won't let me on the team, but I'm just gonna at least admit it. Family, I've been praying, <laughs> I've been seeking God's face. And even right before we began to connect tonight, God was still just like downloading things in my spirit as it relates to this word. So I pray that it blesses you the way that it has already begun to just marinate in my soul. My subject for Activate is structured for a miracle. Structured for a miracle. And I am in Luke 9, verse 12 through 16. It's um, not unfamiliar. Uh, one of the most prominent miracles that we know of Jesus performing. And yet I was looking at it differently and I wanna share with you what I saw. My text begins, it says, when the day began to wear away, the 12 came and said to him, send the multitude away that they may go into the surrounding towns and country and lodge and get provisions for we are in a deserted place here. But he said to them, this he is Jesus. Jesus says to them, you give them something to eat. And they said, we have no more than five loaves and two fish unless we go and buy food for all these people. For there were about 5,000 men. Then he said to his disciples, make them go sit down in groups of 50. And they did so and made them all sit down. Then he took the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke them and gave them to the disciples to set before the multitude. So they all ate and were filled and 12 baskets of the leftover fragments were taken up by them. I added in verse 17 for bonus. God, we thank you. Mm. I thank you for the people connected to this word. I thank you, God, that miracles are just what you do. God, you gave me this word about how we can begin to prepare our lives for miracles. My prayer is that it would become clear, God, that as you feed me, that they would be fed and that together we would continue to be nurtured and nourished in our identity in you. Thank you, God, for the gift of wisdom, insight, and revelation. I thank you that when you stand in a room, that literally strongholds come down and chains are broken. Let this be one of those moments where it is undeniable that we met with you, that we heard from you, and that we were forever changed as a result of it. In Jesus' name I pray. I decided on Monday to finally get back in the gym. You know, um, even though it is beginning to be fall and in fall, it is obviously very important to have extra weight. I have decided that I don't need as much of it as I am carrying. 
So I finally got back on my Peloton tread (laughs) and I was on my Peloton tread and Peloton is so funny. Like when you're logging in every day, they're like, continue your three week streak, continue your four week streak. When you ain't been in there in a long time, like I have been like, hey girl, how you doing? Let's just get this thing started. Okay. So I finished my class and I was dragging and tired and I was running and, you know, I've always said like, I don't necessarily feel like my legs were made for running. You know, they just don't, they don't do what I see other people's legs doing when they run. And so I'm there and I'm winded and I get off of the treadmill and I hear the coach saying as I'm getting off of the treadmill, don't think about how hard the class is. Instead, think about what you accomplished in actually completing the class. The timing was perfect because I was just beginning to feel like I would rather be fat. Have you ever had one of those moments where you say to yourself, if I have to work this hard for it, I don't want it, okay? I would just rather have a little bit more cushion. Right when I was having that thought, he challenged my perspective. And the perspective is that perhaps instead of thinking about how hard it was, how out of shape I am, how I'm having such a difficult time catching my breath, that I then... Instead, look at it as an opportunity for me to pat myself on the back for the fact that I actually showed up and completed the class. It's a small pivot, but it was meaningful because it allowed me to recognize that in order for me to step into this new way of living and being and eating and performing, that I would have to water where I'm headed and not where I've been. In order for me to water the seeds of this identity that I'm trying to step into, that means that I can't still have the same thoughts and paradigms of where I am now. God help me. A lot of times we want to experience change and transformation, but we want the external expression of change, not necessarily the inward structure that produces the change. And when we fall in love with the external expression, we miss the opportunity to become someone who produces those results just organically. If you become on the inside, you won't have to pursue on the outside because your inward disposition would automatically produce. That's just the default sex, default set for your producing from this way of being. I don't have to necessarily become someone who wants a six pack. I just need to change the way that I eat and organically whatever happens to my body will happen. It hit me when I was getting off of the treadmill that my insides are not structured for the outside that I'm hoping for. How true is this? For so many of us who see an outward demonstration of who we could become, But the disconnect is not that we don't see it. It's not that we don't believe it. It's not that we don't want it. It's not that we don't feel like we're called to it. The disconnect is that I'm not structured internally for the external thing that I'm reaching for. I want to be in a healthy relationship, but I keep calling that person that breaks me. My insides aren't structured for the outside that I desire. I want to be better with money, but I also want to buy this thing that's on sale. My insides aren't structured for the outside. I want to break the addiction, but I still want to get high right now. My insides aren't structured for the outside. Can I talk to some real people who would be honest enough to say that there are things that I see happening for my life. There are things that I think would be better for who I am and where I am, but I just don't have the insides for the outside that I'm praying for, and so I've been stuck was studying this text and it resonated with my mind so greatly because I realized that in order for Jesus to perform this miracle that there is a sequence that takes place for the miracle I'm preaching already you didn't even hear it A lot of times we pray for miracles but what we should be looking for is what is the sequence that leads to the miracle Let's define miracles Because a lot of times we reduce miracles down to the big ones, the miracles of wanting my body to be healed, the miracle of wanting a financial blessing. But there are some internal miracles. 
It would take a miracle for me to become this discipline. It would take a miracle for me to step into a position where I feel like I don't have the resources or the experience in order to step into it, but here I am anyway. It would take a miracle for me to speak in public. It would take a miracle for me to walk away from that circumstance. It would take a miracle for me to be a good husband, for me to be a good partner. It would take a miracle for me to do this. You gotta be real about when you need a miracle. A lot of times we think things are within our reach, but just because you can see doesn't mean that you can reach them. The distance between where you are and what you're reaching for sometimes is a miracle. And that's why we need the Holy Spirit to step in because what we're reaching for is not within our reach. I've never seen anyone do it before. I don't have the insides for what I'm reaching for. It's going to take a miracle. And there's nothing wrong with recognizing that something is going to take a miracle because miracles is what God does. Miracles is how he specializes in his character. And when you recognize that it's going to take a miracle, then your relationship relationship with God is deepened because I'm not just asking God to watch me work. I'm asking God to allow me to see his miracle work in my stretch, to see the miracle work in my reach, to recognize that my insides need a miracle more than my outside does. And I fell in love with this text and I've read it a thousand times. And it was funny because the way that God gave me this word is I was praying about activate and God gave me the word. All he said was structured for a miracle, structured for a miracle. And I started looking at different miracles in the Bible and the structure connected to them. And I realized that God didn't perform any miracles. Jesus didn't perform any miracles without there being some type of structure set in place to allow the miracle to take place. PT just preached about miracle about a miracle that Jesus performed on Sunday. And Jesus didn't just give the the deaf man hearing. He didn't just give the blind man sight. There was a structure that there was a sequence that took place. And when we recognize that there is a structure, there's a sequence that we recognize then that in order for the anointing to flow, in order for the power of God to flow, oh God, I feel this. The power of God wants to flow without obstruction. The power of God wants to flow without being limited. It wants to flow without being stopped. And so if there's some obstructions, our job is to move the obstruction out of the way so that when the power flows, it doesn't get blocked by our excuses. It doesn't get blocked by our old way of thinking. It doesn't get blocked by our habits. There is a hunger that produces structure that allows us to clear the path for the power to fall and not just fall, but it to flow. God, I feel you speaking right now. God doesn't just want the power to fall. I want the power to fall and then flow. If it just falls, then it stays in one place. But if it falls and then flows, then it'll touch everything connected to me. Maybe somebody needs to start praying. God, what am I doing that keeps your power from flowing? What is my attitude like that keeps your power from flowing in my relationship? What's happening in my world that keeps the power from flowing in my business and my ideas and my creativity in my home and my communication? The power falls, but I don't want to be a blockage to the power. I want the power to continue flowing when it hits my house, when it hits my mouth, when it hits my spirit. Let it keep on flowing. Let it saturate everything connected to me because I don't want to be greedy with the power. I don't want to just have a revelation that transforms me on the inside, but never reaches out and begins to flow and everything connected to me. It's like that moment when you know you did something wrong, but you don't want to apologize. The conviction falls, but it doesn't flow. So it can't change the relationship or restore and repair what has been broken because you let the conviction fall, but you didn't let it flow. That wasn't even a part of my notes, but I feel like there's somebody who's been holding on to the glory. You've been holding on to the power. You've been holding on to the transformation because you're too afraid to release it because releasing it would create accountability. But I hear God saying that you need to be held accountable to a higher standard. Don't allow yourself to be so comfortable in who you used to be that you don't step all the way into who I've called you to be. That means that when the change falls, that means when the power falls that you have a responsibility to let it flow or stop asking God for power. Stop asking God for change. Stop asking God for transformation so you can hoard it and keep it on the inside. If you're going to ask God for power, don't ask God for power for yourself. Ask God for power so that it can flow connected and flow and hit everything connected to you. God, I want your power to flow through me. 
in me and then through me, in me and then through me, in me and then through me, to my children, in me and then through me, through my ministry, in me and then through me, to my mother, in me and then through me. That's somebody's word right now. In me and then through me. I don't want it just in me. I don't want to be greedy. God's not just going to give it so it can stay down on the inside of me. I want it to flow. And so I have to be structured for the power to flow. I got to be structured for the miracle to flow. The miracle is always about more than just you. Jesus performs miracles in the Bible, one, to prove the power that God has given him, but two, to also allow the word to be spread that the kingdom of heaven is here. The miracles were just baked so that people would recognize that the real deal is here. It was never just about giving people what they wanted. It was about establishing what God was doing in the earth. So when you keep the miracle to yourself, when you don't give out your contacts, when you're so threatened by someone else's potential that you don't create space for them in the room, that miracle can't flow through you so the grace cannot stay on you. But the miracle flows for those who recognize, God, it was you who brought me into this room. God, it was your power that allowed me to even be in this position. And now because I recognize that it was you and not me, I'm not going to get here and keep it all to myself. Anyone I can put on, I'm going to put on. Anyone I can teach, I'm going to teach. Anyone who I can develop, I'm going to develop develop because the power didn't just fall on me. It was meant to fall through me. I feel like that's somebody's word. I don't know who you are. This miracle in Luke 9 is a miracle, not just for the multitudes, but it's a miracle for the disciples as well. Because at this point in the text, Jesus is still developing them into the disciples who will continue his legacy once he has been ascended to heaven. That means that this was more than just a moment. This was about legacy. This was about longevity. And so while the disciples were trying to feed the multitudes, Jesus was trying to feed the disciples. I want the disciples to understand how I think. I want the disciples to understand how I function. I want the disciples to understand what's a problem and what's not a problem. I want the disciples to understand what they have access to. And so I'm using this problem to really grow them up into becoming who I've called them to be. That feels like somebody's word right there. This problem is not really just about the problem. The problem is about who you become in the midst of solving the issue. It's about who you become in the midst of growing into this role. And Jesus says, I'm going to use the problem, but the problem's going to work on your behalf because who you become in the process is what's going to make all of the difference. Let me get in my notes because y'all got me out here. I want to break down this moment. I've already read you the text but I want to break down in sequence what happens. So the disciples acknowledge that there is a problem. The disciples acknowledge that there is a problem and they offer a solution. They're not the kind of disciples that just say, Jesus, here's the problem. They say, Jesus, here is the problem and also here is a solution. The only problem is that the solution is within their reach. Sometimes we give God our solutions, but God says in order to be in relationship with me, you're going to have to be open to what my solution may be. This is a war of solutions. Somebody's been in a war of solutions. And you've been asking God, you've been telling God, here is a solution to my problem. And God hasn't given you the solution. But just because God didn't give you your solution doesn't mean that there isn't a solution. I hear God saying that I have a solution on reserve, but you have to be willing to let go of what you think the solution is so that you can be structured for the miracle of my solution. God's miracle, God's solution is a miracle. What God wants to do is going to look like a miracle. What you want to do is feasible. What you want to do is logical. What you want to do is critical thinking put to the test. But God says, what I want to do is going to be unnatural. What I want to do, eyes haven't seen. What I want to do, an ear hasn't heard about it. I want to do the unthinkable. I want to perform a miracle. My solution is a miracle. Do you understand that when we start asking God to release his power, that we are quite literally asking for a miracle. And when we begin to ask God for a miracle, that solution has to be treated as such 
the disciples offer their solution and Jesus rejects it. He rejects the solution. I know you put your heart into it. I know you thought about it. I know it makes sense on paper. I know you just got settled. I know this would be the ideal outcome for you, but I reject your solution. I don't know about you, but I am grateful for a God that rejects my solutions because when God rejects my solution, it lets me know he's got a greater and bigger plan. And I am so submitted and surrendered to who God is that when he rejects my solution, I sit back and wait. When he rejects my solution, I sit back and see what's going to happen now because you didn't allow this to go the way that I wanted it to which means you've got a surprise for me I start straightening my collar because God's about to throw me a surprise party God I don't know how you're going to do it but I trust you're going to do it God I don't know when it's going to make sense but I know one day the math is going to math God I trust your solution so the disciples their solution has been rejected and Jesus says the most peculiar thing He says to all of the disciples, you feed them. First of all, have you ever had God ask you to do something that he could do? Like, God, why is it that you want me to try and help this person heal? God, why is it that you want me to help erect this book? God, why is it that you want me to help show up in this moment? But God asks them to do something that creates partnership. I thought that this was interesting because Jesus doesn't say to them, you all feed them. He doesn't say you all get together and figure it out. All he says is you feed them. To me, this was such an example of why we have to study the character of God. God doesn't pick out one particular person, but he speaks with definition. It almost reminds me of he who has an ear, let him hear. Because when he says you feed them, that you either sounds like a command to someone or a question to someone else. And God is looking for who hears his word as a command. When he says you feed them, Jesus says you feed them. Is this a question? Are you asking me to feed them or is this a command? And there are some people and heaven has sent you word after word after word. And you tried to shake it and you tried to let it go. And the reason why you couldn't do it is because it was a command. It was not a question. It was not a hypothetical. It was not something random that maybe you could or maybe you shouldn't do. This was a command from heaven and Jesus was looking to see who would respond to the command, who would set in motion whatever the command I've given is supposed to be. And instead of looking around, the disciples have to ask within themselves, can I respond to this command? I want to let somebody know that if you heard what Jesus said as a command, if you heard what heaven has been saying to you as a command, then it is a sign that you have exactly what it takes to answer that command. And God wants to give you the grace and the knowledge and the strategy and the wisdom to say yes to that command. It was a command. It was a command. It wasn't a dream. It wasn't just an idea. It was a command. I command you to build that church. I command you to feed those people. Look at what he says. He says, you feed them. Who's going to feed your community? Who's going to feed them hope? Who's going to feed them inspiration? Who's going to feed them transformation? Who's going to feed them conviction? Who's going to feed them another way of doing it? And all heaven is saying is you feed them. That's why I say sometimes this isn't everyone's word. This is a word for someone who hears heaven commanding them to come out of their hidden places, to come out of their secret places. He gives them a command. You, whoever you are, this is your word. If you can't shake it, I'm talking to you. If your faith is being stretched, I'm talking to you. If it's you, I want you to type it in the comments. It's me, it's me, it's me, it's me. Only God can send a word out to the masses and everyone feels like he's talking exclusively to them. This is exactly what happens in this text. Jesus sends a word and all of the disciples respond because one word felt so personal that everyone had to get in the game. He says, you feed them. For me, this helps me to recognize that part of being structured for a miracle is recognizing the command of structuring your life for the miracle. It was a command. 
I've been sensing in my spirit that I have a responsibility to really take care of my family in a different way. And I realized that in order for me to do it, I'm going to have to structure their lives differently. And in order for me to structure their lives differently, I have to take ownership of it. That's what Jesus is saying in this text. Take ownership of this problem. You take ownership of it. Don't just pass this problem along to someone else. If it is highlighted in your spirit, then you have a responsibility to respond to what's been highlighted you are the answer. You are the one who sees it, so you are the one who can fix it. Now, if you need help, come holla at me. If you need me to give you some strategy, then get in your prayer closet and we can figure it out. But everyone's 5,000 people there, but only a few started realizing that they're going to be hungry. God says, I've given you insight on what's going to happen. I've given you insight of what comes down the line, and because I've given you insight, it's because I also want to give you strategy. God doesn't just give insight without strategy. You feed them. So now, how do I structure? The disciples are like, okay, how do I structure this multitude for what it is that you want to do? So they're structuring the multitude, but Jesus is structuring them. Jesus structures them by giving them a command. Their response is to tell Jesus what they have. The disciples tell them, tell Jesus, we have no more than five loaves and two fish unless we go and buy food for all these people. Part of being structured for a miracle, if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down, is you have to be willing to relinquish the pathology that makes you minimize what you have. The disciples say, we only have these two fish and these five loaves, they discredit what they have. But when they tell Jesus what they have, it also illuminates what Jesus can do with what they have. God, I wish I could say this. When you discredit what you have, what you tell heaven is, I don't have anything on it. All I have is a heart to do it and and the ability to serve my way up. All I have is the idea in my head. I don't have the finances. I don't have the resources. All I have is an idea. And God says, I know that's what you have, but I want you to not discredit what you have. You have to see what you have as powerful. You have to see what you bring to the table as powerful. You have to see it as seed. Even if it looks disconnected from the actual need, it's still a seed. And because I see it as seed, I won't discredit it. God, this is what I have. But if you put it in the ground and you bear it and you allow your word to water it and you allow your power to fall and flow through it, then what I have could be multiplied. And I hear God saying that someone's been thinking that they don't have anything on it because they don't have enough. And I hear God saying that you've got something on it though. Don't discredit the something that you have on it. I may not have much, but I've got faith. I may not have much, but I've got some courage on it. I may not have much, but I've got some prayer on it. I may not have much, but I've got some hope on it. I've got some strategy on it. I've got some late nights to put in the game. I've got a little bit of time. It's 30 minutes a day, but I figure out I'll figure out what to do with that time. God, I've got something that I can put on it. You've got something that you can put on it. And God says, if you give me something, I'll give you more than you've ever seen. If you give me something, I'll give you exceedingly and abundantly. Everything that God does, he does it in seed form. If you give me a little, I'll give you a lot, but you got to see your little properly. I wrote about this in Mormon Evolve. You got to see your little properly. It's not a little to God. So it can't be a little to you. And if you refuse to see your little as a lot, then you'll miss the opportunity to see what God can do with your little. The disciples, they, they tell Jesus, this is, This is all that we have. When God gets ready to structure you for a miracle, you've got to be willing to do something with what you have. Don't just sit on it. 
I don't know who you are, but I hear God saying, don't just sit on what you have. You may just have a few followers on social media, but don't just sit on it. You may only have a few people who you can pray with, but don't just sit on it. I hear God saying, don't sit on what you have. I can use that. If I'm going to get structured for this miracle, if I'm going to allow God's power to fall on me, I'm going to make sure that I've done everything that I can do with what I have. I'm going to take what I have and put it in alignment with what it is that you want to do. The disciples, they tell Jesus what they have. And then Jesus doesn't do what I would have done, which is why he is Jesus and I am me. Because if I would have known that I could just take it and break it and feed them, I would have just immediately fed them. But for some reason, he tells them to divide them up into groups. Now we're moving away from what seems like the adequate next step for the miracle. Seems like if they need more food, then the focus should be on the food. But the focus isn't on the food. He puts them down in the middle of the need. I would think, as we come to learn, that the most important miracle would require all of us to be focused on the food. But in this situation and circumstance, Jesus reveals to us that he's gonna focus on the food. I want you to focus on the need. (laughs) Let me say that differently. Jesus is gonna focus on the miracle. The disciples need to focus on how we're gonna be structured for the miracle to flow. When you look at your life, when you consider the areas of your life that are in need of a miracle, the miracle is not a problem. It's in the hands of Jesus. The miracle is not a problem. The Holy Spirit already has plans for the actual thing that will produce the miracle. But are you structured for the miracle to flow? So I recognize that while Jesus was structuring the multitude, he was also structuring the disciples because can you imagine who they became in trying to divide 500 people in groups of 50? How they had to learn to communicate. How they had to learn to count. How they had to learn to help people move into groups to create boundaries and restrictions. How they had to settle people and calm them down. It looks like exactly the kind of work that they would be doing as fishers of men. It's when I recognized that Jesus was structuring them for the miracle of them being apostles when he had been ascended. This was so powerful for me because I realized that so often I spend a lot of time trying to figure out the structure that I miss who I have become in the process. You're watching this with me right now and you have had your fair share of diving into the need, rolling up your sleeves and doing what needs to be done. You know all about that. But you never take inventory of who you became when you dove into the need. When you finally just dived into that need, you became more empathetic, you became more strategic, you became more reliable, you had more strength, you learned to communicate. Who did you become when you dived into the need? These disciples are dealing with the multitude, but Jesus is dealing with them. If we're going to be structured for the miracles that our life needs, we have to be willing to see how we are growing so that we don't miss the miracles that have already taken place inside of us. For somebody, it's a miracle you're even watching this video. For someone else, it's a miracle you're even in that role. For someone, it's a, it's a miracle you're even in that relationship. It's a miracle that my child is even moving on to this stage of life. Somebody's already experienced miracles. But you didn't allow the miracles to communicate the growth and development that God was producing inside of you. You, my friend, are structured for a miracle. 
if you're willing to roll up your sleeves and do the work. I want to say this prophetically to you as I was praying about this message. Heaven's got something that's happening. And I'm still trying to decipher exactly what it is. But one thing I hear God saying over and over again to me in my prayer life is that heaven cannot do it unless we are structured for the flow. I feel revival is coming to our nation. Revival is coming to our world. And the revival has got to be able to flow. The revival has got to be able to go into the ends of the earth. The revival has got to be able to touch the deepest, darkest corners. And it's got to touch the deepest, darkest souls. And there is a restructuring taking place right now so that when the power Power falls, when the glory falls, when the doors open up, that the, the, hev, the floodgates of heaven will be open and there will be no place on earth that will ever experience a drought again. And I hear God saying that it is time for us to come into alignment and to begin to structure ourselves for miracles. What does it mean to be structured for a miracle? It means there's a certain level of boundary. There's a certain level of discipline. There is a certain level of internal decisions that I need to make and it's going to take a miracle for them to happen. I want to pray with you. I want to pray with someone who understands this divine mandate. The divine mandate of being structure, structured for the miracle that God wants to do in the earth. As I was praying and studying, I started asking God myself, what are those internal things? I'm, I never want to ask God just for that external. But God, who do I need to become to make sure that I don't stand in the way of your flow? The safest place in the whole wide world is in the will of the Lord. And I want to make sure that I'm in the will, not stopping the will. So God, what do I need to grieve? What comfort zone do I need to step out of? How will you stretch me? How will you grow me? So that I can be a part of the structure of the miracle that you have assigned to where I am located. There is a miracle assigned to where you are positioned. And if you are not careful, you will allow yourself to stand in the way of that miracle. And so we got to roll up our sleeves and dig into the need so that we can create space and room for this miracle to flow. My favorite part of this text says that when it was all said and done, that they all ate and were filled. And 12 baskets of the leftover fragments were taken up there was leftovers. That's the kind of miracle that God does. That's the type of solution that God offers. Not only will I feel this need, but I will also have leftovers connected to it. Jesus recognized that though the disciples wanted provision, that it was more important that they become provision than receive provision. That's somebody's word right now. We love to talk about how God is our provider and how we call him Jaira. I love he always provides. I just want you to recognize that when we're saying that, that sometimes you are the provision, that that provision is not always a thing, that sometimes God raises up people to be provision. And I feel like whoever's watching this, and if this is your word, I want you to grab it, that God is not just calling you to be a receiver. I'm calling you to be a provider. I'm calling you to be made in my image, which means you should become provision and when we step out of the need to only just be receivers 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 then we step into a room and we start thinking I'm made in the image of God and when I came into this room I want to understand what I can provide to this space that I'm in because I'm not just a receiver I'm also God's provision you're God's provision for your partner you're God's provision for that child you're God's provision for that business you're God's provision for that ministry you are God's provision and so while you're asking God to provide I want you to also also recognize that God made you provision and because God has made you provision you can't just step into the room with your own ideas and your own plans and your own thoughts 
you have to be willing to ask God, what is it that I can provide to this room? Don't ask the room because the room may have a solution that doesn't look like what God has in mind. And you may have to meet their solution on one level, but the ultimate level is, God, you sent me into this room. God, you sent me into this city. You sent me into this moment. God, you're sending me into this conference. What is it that I can provide for the people assigned to my provision? I want to pray with you. I want to pray that God would give us a heart to be providers as well. That God would give us the discipline and the courage to step into the structure required for our miracles. Man, I just want you to type it in the comments. I'm being structured. I'm being structured. I'm being structured. That's why it feels so awkward. That's why it feels so uncomfortable. I'm being structured. I'm being structured. Because when I pray, I want to make sure that this prayer hits those who are being structured, who's being structured. I'm undergoing a renovation. I'm undergoing a change. Not on the outside. I'm talking about on the inside. On the outside, most of my life still looks the same. For some of you, your life is also going through a restructuring. But there's someone else you're watching this, and it feels like nothing has really changed on the outside. It's me. I'm the one that's changing. I'm being structured for the miracle. Your life is a miracle. Your purpose is a miracle. And yet the miracle isn't ready to just sit on you. You have to be structured for that. Jesus was born the Messiah, but he didn't get on the cross the day after he was born. He had to go through 33 years of life so that he could be structured for the miracle of the resurrection. And somebody's being structured for the miracle of the resurrection connected to what died in you, what died in your family, what died in your generation. And I hear God saying, I'm going to bring it back to life, but you got to be structured for it. God, I thank you. Thank you that you never leave us nor forsake us, which means that we're not being structured without your oversight. That we're not being structured without your hand on our life. God, I pray that for those who are plugged into this word, that you would bring them into the awareness and consciousness that they are being structured with your plan and your vision in mind. Father, we repent for being frustrated. We repent for thinking that you didn't know what you were doing. We repent for thinking that our path and our way would have been better. And we ask for forgiveness, God, because we recognize that we put our will above your will. But because you still have us here, it is a sign that we still have a chance to lay it all down. So God, we lay it down. We lay down our will. We lay down our solution. We lay down our inadequacy. We lay down our thoughts and our plans and we say, we hear it as a command where we are. Not a request, but a command. God, we wanna feed them. We wanna feed them. We don't wanna just be fed for the sake of being fed. We wanna feed everyone connected to us and we cannot do it unless, unless you produce a miracle in us and then through us. God, help us to silence the voices so that when the power falls, it can flow without obstruction. Forgive us, Father, for doing this thing on our own. We receive your power. We receive your strength. We receive your ultimate authority, God. We receive it, and we call it sovereign. And we call it the only way that there is. Your will above our will every day of our life. Help us to be reminded of that when we decide to hijack the wheel. And instead, may we give it back to you. God, I thank you for every person watching. I thank you for the miracles that you already have appointed to their lives. God, may they show up. May they not be late. May they bring all of themselves. And may they come in the best condition possible because they took seriously the grace on their lives and the grace on this moment. Seal this word, Father, as only you can do. Allow it to take root and produce fruit. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. I have to say amen more than once. I don't know what's wrong with me. Um, 
I'm in it with you, family. I'm being structured for this miracle with you. And I have to tell you, I kind of like who I'm becoming, even though I'm tired, okay? She'd be tired, but she's also enjoying where she's becoming. I want to offer you an opportunity to sow into this word, to sow into this ministry, to take what you think may be a little and allow God to take the seed and multiply it into a lot. That's one of the reasons why I love giving, because no matter how much I give, it is small in comparison to what God has done for me. Is that anyone else's testimony? No matter what God has done for me, whatever I give in return is small. And yet I give it anyway because I recognize that I want to have reciprocity in my relationship with God. I want to have reciprocity. God, I don't want to just be a receiver. I don't want to just be someone who takes. I want to show you that I can sow back into what you're doing in the earth. And it is undeniable that this ministry, this word has shaken up something down on the inside of you. And I just want to ask you to respond to this by giving, by sowing by allowing us to continue to meet the needs of people, not just in our city, but literally throughout the world. Of course, we're meeting the spiritual needs. You know we're here. We take our position every Thursday, every Sunday. We make sure we're in the pocket every day on our social media. But it's not just spiritual. We've been called to literally be openers, to be the hands and feet of Jesus on the earth. There are so many things that we want to do, and we've been able to do it because of your generosity. And if you want to see some of those things, go to our website and look at all of the organizations that we give to, but also help empower us to reach even more people. There are instructions on the screen for how to give. I just want to pray over your seat because I recognize that it's a lot and a little all at the same time. And yet it's seed. And when you put seed in the ground, there is harvest connected to it. God, thank you for this seed. Thank you for the giver. Thank you for the provider of this seed, God. Thank you that even through the act of giving that we get to become provision, that we allow our seed to go into what you're doing in the earth. We are a part of being your hands and feet because we have decided to not just be someone who receives the word, but who provides so that others can receive as well. I thank you, God, that as we partner with you, that your word has countless promises. And we know then that you'll open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing we don't have room enough to receive. You've got so many promises connected to giving, and yet we're not giving for a promise. We're giving out of acknowledgement of what you've already done, the promise we're already standing in. I thank you, God, that you continue to show up and because you continue to show up, we'll continue to partner with you in every area, not the least of which is our finances. Take this seed, Father. Build your church. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, family. I love you so much. And you know when we activate that we got to follow it up with an incredible Sunday word. Make sure that you're plugged in, rate, subscribe. Make sure that you are connected to our podcast and anywhere you can get the word because we have a mandate and a mission to be openers and structured for our miracles. May we become evidence. Take care. <laughs>